My name is Martin Baptist. I work for IMARES, the Institute for Marine Resources and Ecosystem Studies. I graduated in ecology at Wageningen University and I did a PhD in hydraulic engineering at Delft University. Since its start, I am involved in EcoShape and I have been involved in various Building with Nature studies. In this clip, I will give you a brief introduction into ecosystem services. In 2000, Dutch Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen suggested that humans have had such profound and far-reaching impacts on the Earth's ecosystems that we have ushered into a new geologic era, the Anthropocene. We now live in a human-centered era where humans act as a force of nature. Living in the Anthropocene means that we have to deal with systems that emerge not only from an initial interplay of climate and geological processes, but also from dynamic interactions of society with nature. Advances have been made towards describing an integrated, holistic approach towards these nature-society interactions. A useful concept for that are ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are defined as the benefits acquired by humankind from ecosystems. This concept was popularized by the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the so-called MA, in 2004. This MA grouped ecosystem services into four broad categories. One, provisioning services, such as the production of food and water. Two, regulating services, such as the control of climate and disease. Three, cultural services, such as spiritual and recreational benefits. And fourth, supporting services, such as nutrient cycles and primary production. An ecosystem does not necessarily offer all four types of services at the same time, but given the intricate nature of any ecosystem, it is usually assumed that humans benefit from a combination of these services. Now I will give you an example of an ecosystem service. Whales provided an important ecosystem service when they were hunted. They delivered products such as oil, baleen and meat. Whale oil was vital in illuminating homes and businesses throughout the world in the 19th century. It also served as a lubricant for the machines of the Industrial Revolution. Baleen, the long strips that hang in the mouth of the whale, was used by manufacturers in the United States and Europe to make consumer goods such as buggy whips, fishing poles, corset stays and dress hoops. And of course the meat was eaten. However, in 1986, commercial whaling was banned. Humankind can no longer benefit from the useful products that whales provided us. So, do whales still provide an ecosystem service or are they now just useless creatures causing a lot of nuisance when they wash ashore? Well, with millions of participants, the whale watching industry is worth $2 billion annually. So this is an example of a cultural service. Whales still provide an ecosystem service, just a different one. But there is more. We should be careful not to frame habitats or species only in terms of the services we can use. Such an approach does not consider the intrinsic value of life forms that are not directly of use for us. But what is intrinsic value and does nature have intrinsic value or not? To address this question, philosopher Richard Routley in 1973 devised a thought experiment that became known as the last man argument. In his thought experiment, Routley asks us to imagine an earth where everyone has died except for one man. Before this man dies himself, he ensures that all other life on earth will be eliminated as well. The question I ask you is, 
has this man done anything morally wrong? If you thought, no, nobody cares, since there's nobody left, you probably have an anthropocentric ethic in which the only things that have value are humans. If you thought, yes, it's wrong, because it's not fair to kill, they deserve to live as well, you probably have a non-anthropocentric ethic in which non-human nature has intrinsic value. Various attempts have been made to merge the concepts of intrinsic value and ecosystem services. Although the concept of ecosystem services in principle does not cover benefits to nature and the intrinsic value of such benefits, intrinsic value is not necessarily incompatible with economic valuation. Many people pay for the protection of animals, for instance by donating to Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Fund. By doing this, they place value on animal existence and therefore they assign an economic value to intrinsic value. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment therefore adds intrinsic value under cultural ecosystem services. I now want to elaborate on marine and coastal ecosystem services and sandy shores in particular. Recently, a systematic literature overview of all marine and coastal ecosystem services was published. This paper, by Liket and others, is prescribed reading for this course. The Ecoshape Consortium also categorized different types of coasts and specified the corresponding ecosystem services for sandy shores. I will explain them to you under each of the four aspects. Provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services and supporting services. First, provisioning services. Provisioning concerns natural resources including products that a society gets from ecosystems. I'll give you a few examples of products that are provided by sandy shores. Fresh water, as rainwater filtrates into the dune sand, creating a freshwater aquifer. Food, such as fish and shellfish. Shallow coastal areas are important nursery zones for many fish caught commercially and sold to you as food. Construction materials. Beach sand is often collected for construction works. Some types of coastal grass have traditionally been used for weaving household utensils. Wood from dune forests is used as well. Alternative energy is a last example of a provision. Energy can be derived from wind, waves, tides or even from algae. Second, we have regulating services. These are benefits that arise from how a system regulates processes, resources and its own properties. Benefits obtained from regulation by sandy shores are for instance coastal protection against flooding and erosion. Beaches attenuate waves. Dunes act as a barrier and as a sand buffer. Windblown sand transport gradually restores dune fronts that have been eroded in a storm. Natural dune vegetation actively promotes the development of dunes by trapping wind-blown sands. In the Netherlands, therefore, dunes are actively managed as a primary flood defense. Another benefit obtained from regulation by sandy shores is water regulation. Dunes store and purify water, affecting hydrology and water quality in surroundings, which may be beneficial to agriculture. Another benefit, sediment transport. Natural processes like waves and tides facilitate the transport of sediments and enable the coast to assume its natural alignment after being disturbed. And now we've come to a third ecosystem service, the cultural services. These are non-material benefits people enjoy like Tourism and recreational activities, such as swimming, surfing and sailing. You also have research and educational benefits. Coastal systems are important subjects of scientific research. And what about aesthetic value? The appreciation of beaches and dunes 
makes Sandy Coast an attractive living environment. As you know, houses close to the beach cost more. People also find reflection and spiritual enrichment at the coast. Imagine the stunning beauty of a sunset at the beach. Finally, we have supporting services. Some services are necessary to enable the other three categories. This is about sustaining critical ecosystem processes that determine the vitality and resilience of ecosystems. Basically, these services create the boundary conditions. I can give you a few examples for sandy shores. Habitat provision for animals and plants, such as refuge and forage area for different species of wading shorebirds. Wave dissipation. Beach and foreshore attenuate waves, providing for quiet conditions further landward. And soil formation. This forms the boundary condition for dune vegetation to grow and develop. So to conclude, Recognizing the economic value of nature and the services provided to humanity has become increasingly essential for hydraulic engineering. Natural and anthropogenic drivers of change, including hydraulic infrastructures, cause ecosystem impacts. They range from erosion, siltation, eutrophication and overfishing to expansion of the built environment and vulnerability to sea level rise. Traditionally, projects pay little attention to the supporting ecosystem services. As a result, many traditional projects have many negative impacts, undermining the system's integrity, sustainability and resilience. Natural assets of the coastal zone have suffered significant loss worldwide over the last three decades. About 50% of marshes were lost or degraded, 35% of mangroves have disappeared and 30% of coral reefs have vanished. Building with Nature adopts a new approach, paying full attention to the supporting services in particular in order to achieve sustainable development. The basic idea is that natural processes are not only complied with, but are also used and stimulated so that infrastructures fit sustainably within the natural environment and new opportunities for nature are provided. Thank you for your attention.